Hi, I'm Denise Cardona with the Office of Professional Programs at UMBC, and I am here with Sally Scott, Program Director of UMBC's Graduate Program in Community Leadership. Today, Sally and I are going to discuss her recent contribution in a report she co-authored with Asima Iyer of the Jacob France Institute at the University of Baltimore, titled Overcoming Barriers to Home Ownership in Baltimore City. Welcome, Sally. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you, Denise. It's great to be here. So I thought we'd start with, if you could tell us a little bit about like a brief summary of what the report covers. Sure. So the report uh, initially came out of a question that we were asked by the Abel Foundation, which was, could we help more people become homeowners in Baltimore if they had access to more flexible loans and better incentives? such as closing cost assistance. And that seems like a straightforward question, but as we dug into it, we looked at the local data and the national data, we realized that those proposed solutions would not be enough. And that's because there are much deeper issues at work, limiting people's home ownership opportunities in Baltimore, and that's particularly true in the black community. And so we learned that decades really of systemic racism as well as the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, have created barriers to home ownership in the Black community in Baltimore, and that to address those would require a much more systemic and far-reaching solutions than simply better loans and better incentives. What was the catalyst to beginning work on this report, and what was your role in co-writing it? Mm -hmm. Well, a friend of mine, um, Tracy Barber Gillette, who works at the Abel Foundation, and I had coffee, and she said they had read this article by a national expert named Ben Hecht of the Living Cities Foundation, who was saying that possibly providing these flexible loans and incentives would be a way to get roughly 1% of Americans, 3 million people, into home ownership who currently are not homeowners. So that was a significant claim and we were trying to figure out if that's true in Baltimore. So I have good connections and background with a lot of the groups doing home ownership initiatives in Baltimore. And the Seema Iyer at the Jacob France Institute, University of Baltimore is a data expert who does wonderful work um, on citywide data of all types, including home ownership. So I paired up with Seema and through the combination of quantitative work that Seema and her team did and the qualitative work, uh, the document review and the interviews that I conducted with a lot of people who are active in this field in Baltimore, I think we were able to to really get to some deeper uh, roots and and farther reaching solutions than had initially been proposed. Can you talk about why black ownership is declining? Right. So it, black home ownership from 2007 to 2017 went from 45% to 42%. Now, part of that was part of a national crisis really in our country, which was the Great Recession and its aftermath. Uh, the thing is that other ethnic groups in America have recovered more thoroughly and more quickly from the Great Recession than black homeowners have. And so I think a real clue is what happened during that great recession to make recovery uh, so difficult for black homeowners. And uh, what we found was that the recession preyed upon a lot of people who had more recently become homeowners or become homeowners with exploitative loans. 10 plus years ago now, but I think a lot of us remember that there were a lot of bad loans that were extended leading up to the Great Recession, and even even loans that weren't even signed by anybody, they were just um, offered. And that tended to take advantage of consumers who were more vulnerable to begin with, and a number of those consumers were black home buyers. And there was even targeting by some lenders of black homeowners for these bad loans. So coming out of that, a lot of black families lost their homes, to foreclosure, and then ended up with poor credit and higher debt 
And on top of that, we've got a country where economic inequality has been growing. So when you add up all these factors, you can't say it's one thing, but when you add up these different factors and the decades before that of systemic racism, there is a large group of black consumers who are really uh, limited in their ability to buy a home. And that keeps the home ownership rate down. And the rental market, however, is not very affordable in Baltimore and many places. So people trying to make that shift from being renters to being homeowners are also facing a difficult challenge uh, in saving up their money if they're paying higher than 30% or 50% of their income on rent. Yeah, absolutely. That must be very challenging for so many people. My next question is, what personally motivated you to want to co-write this report? What made you want to dig in and research this and find solutions? Well, I've worked in community development in Baltimore since 1998 and have been involved in a lot of different programs and initiatives as I was the uh, program officer for the Goldsecker Foundation. And then I worked for the Baltimore Neighborhood Collaborative nonprofit citywide organization. And I've always been trying to understand you know, how we can help our neighborhoods, how we can help our residents really thrive in Baltimore. And yet the data was saying that there's a, a set of folks who aren't thriving, who are finding this time particularly difficult to become homeowners. And that's not to say you have to become a homeowner to thrive. I think there are plenty of people who do well as renters, but there are people who want to become homeowners and can't. And they're missing out on what is the main asset for most Americans. You know, we think about the stock market, but for the most Americans, most of us, the main asset we'll ever own is our home. And so if one is blocked from um, being a homeowner or one's asset as a homeowner is declining in value instead of gaining in value, that's a real problem. I really wanted to understand what was going on and realized that, you know, that would take a, a deeper dive than simply what one can learn from talking to folks, reading the newspaper, that we really needed to dig into the data and we really needed to talk to the people who were involved every day in housing counseling, marketing, homeownership in the city, realtors, lenders. It took that kind of 360 approach. And you know, as the director of community leadership at UMBC, I really want to be able to bring to our program and to our students current understanding of what the dynamics are in Baltimore City. It's a city I love. I've lived there for over 25 years. And despite its uh, many challenges, I think it offers so much. And so I think whatever I can provide as a researcher or as someone who's helping prepare people to work in Baltimore, that's of interest to me. And I hope to be able to go on and, and do additional research along these lines as well. Speaking of research, can you talk a little bit about some of the research methods that you used to create this report? Sure. Well, on the quantitative side, Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, Sina, Sima Iyer is the director there. They really looked at census data and Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which is called HUMDA, which is really helps you understand if somebody applies for a mortgage, do they get accepted or not? And if they're not accepted, what are the reasons for their decline? So you start to get some insight into why folks are having challenges buying homes. Then on the qualitative side, which is really where I um, have more experience and expertise, I, of course, did a very thorough uh, document review. There's been some excellent research done um, at the national level and also studies done locally, which were very helpful. But I think even perhaps more, more helpful in some ways, or at least something that added an additional flavor to the report was talking to folks who do this work. So there's an organization called Live Baltimore, which has a remarkably good website. If you're looking to buy a home in Baltimore, you can go on that website and find all the, the loan products, the incentive products that will help you buy a home. And talking to the folks there, they were extremely helpful and generous with their time. Also, there's a lot of great nonprofit organizations in Baltimore that either provide housing counseling 
financial coaching, or they actually rehab houses or build new houses to offer affordable housing. It's really hard work. It takes combining lots of different sources of money. So I would not really have gained the understanding that I did of the challenges of this work if I hadn't had the opportunity to talk to them. I've worked with a lot of these people in previous roles I've had in nonprofits and foundations in Baltimore. And uh, I really appreciated their taking their time to educate me about the details and the challenges of their work. Um, so I have a lot of respect for those folks and I wanted to be able to put their work into the larger context and provide the statistical background as well. Can you talk a little bit about some of the significant barriers that do exist for potential home buyers? Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, it was really a sh- kind of a shocking statistic to me when I learned from one of the groups that develops affordable housing in Baltimore that out of every hundred people who contact them and say, I'm interested in um, becoming a, a homeowner through this program, only one person actually ends up buying a house. So that's a little bit shocking. And I think it's indicative of the number of barriers along the way. And that the the current pool of products and incentives um, and services that are offered are very effective for people who are financially ready or close to ready to buying a house. And, you know, they're very useful in this. The city of Baltimore, I think, um, is is generous. They offer about $3.3 million dollars in incentives and those get to the people who wanna buy the homes and they provide a useful service. But that pool of people who are ready or close to ready is much smaller than this larger pool of people who you know, love the idea of buying, of not having to you know, pay rent every month, but actually having a, an asset that's growing over time. But they face in our deeply unequal, economically unequal system, um, often their incomes are not very high or not high, not high enough. Even if their incomes are high enough, they may have credit problems um, because of you know, past challenges, uh, the Great Recession, the fact that you know, you've got to pay so much money sometimes to uh, get an education. You know, they, they've taken on debt and their debt may be high, their credit may be low. And so with these folks, what I found is there are a, there's a set of nonprofits who are learning that the typical, you know, six week, eight weeks of education and counseling is not enough. What you need is a financial coach who can really sit with you and understand your specific situation. And then over a period of, you know, one year, two year, you know, you might meet every month or so, help you work out those financial obstacles and gets you into the position of being able to buy a home. Or even if you're not at the end of that ready to buy a home, you still have benefited from the financial advice and knowledge that you've gained. And so the folks who do this work every day on the ground say it it does produce results, but it's time intensive and it's labor intensive. So I think making more of those services available would help folks overcome their barriers. Um, But I I'm a real advocate too for um, increased uh, federal attention to this issue because I think sometimes cities like Baltimore, who've been through so much, are expected to solve these problems on their own. You know, the biggest housing uh, subsidy in our country goes to upper income home buyers who can write off the uh, interest on their mortgage, right, as a tax deduction. And that's, you know, tens of billions of dollars more going into that than is, are going into housing programs, whether rental or home ownership for people at the lower income um, end of the spectrum. So I think there's really a rebalancing that we need to do in our federal policy and federal dollars. But while we're working on that and waiting for that, there are both nonprofit and public agencies and private developers, small developers who are doing the right thing in Baltimore, whose work um, also could be supported. It takes a nation really to solve this kind of an issue. And the more people who come together, the more organizations that come together, these local businesses that you spoke about, the more people get involved, the more things will get solved. 
Well, and I think one, you know, this COVID-19 crisis is terrible disaster, really, for so many people economically and just in terms of their health. One thing I think it is helping people realize, though, is that housing policy and health policy are, and economic policy, really, are completely intertwined. If, if people are housing insecure, if they're at risk of getting evicted, if they're living in a shelter, or if they're potentially going to be foreclosed upon, that can have tremendous implications for their health as well. So if we can you know, really internalize that and take that seriously, then we might start to reallocate our resources because keeping people out of hospitals saves us a lot of money down the road. And we have seen both in Baltimore and elsewhere, hospitals, health institutions, playing a larger role in helping people get access to decent housing. Um, I think we could, you know, we could do a lot more of that. So COVID-19 has illustrated the, the depths of the inequality and challenge that people are facing in terms of their housing. And uh, I do hope a little bit like uh, happened during the Great Depression many decades ago, that this will lead to some really profound changes in the way we organize our, our economic and our housing systems in this country. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. And that gives a lot of lift, I think, to the program, UMBC's Community Leadership Program, and the involvement of students in the community is paramount. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that. But before we get to that, I want to just go over some of the incentives that are being proposed by this report. If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So what we found is there actually are quite a few incentives out there. If you go onto the Live Baltimore website, you know, you can find them. There are, and that includes, so loan products, mortgage products, closing cost assistance, uh, live near your work benefits to help people buy a house maybe near the university or the private business where they live. And then there are programs that renovate homes and then help people get, um, renovate homes and then help people get loans to move into those. So they're all good, but they are confusing and complex. And I think one phrase that we came up with was complexity without scale, meaning that there are a lot of programs um, that are really targeted to a fairly small number of people. And overall, they're not helping as many people as they could if they were both better funded and I think easier to navigate. So the big recommendation there, and this was echoed by many of the housing counselors that I talked to, was just make streamline the programs make them easier to navigate and make it easier for people who are not uh, experts in this already to find the incentive that, that they need to find. Sounds easier <laughs> than it is to do simply because you've got um, city government, state government, very involved, very important player in this, um, businesses and nonprofits. So you'd have to find ways for those groups to come together. One example that I saw as I was looking around the country is something called Take Root Milwaukee, which came out of their foreclosure crisis. A lot of these groups had started working together and talking together, including you know, banks and public agencies and nonprofits. And they decided they're going to have one, one number, kind of one website you can call if you're trying to buy a house, or if you're trying to hang on to your house. And then that, through that one number, you get sent to the proper organization to, to help you. So that's, um, that's one model. I don't know if that's the right model for Baltimore, but hopefully um, this report will provide some incentives just to take a, a new look at what's being offered and, and how to make it less complex to navigate. Now this report went live, was it last week? I think it was a week ago, Tuesday. What has the result been so far? Has there been any reaction from the community? Yes, there has, it's been exciting. There was, a, I think, Baltimore Business Journal ran an art, article on it. Baltimore Brew, which is a website-based kind of collection of, of news stories, wrote a story about it. And then I had the opportunity to go on the um, Midday with Tom Hall show with uh, two other people who've written reports on related topics, and then also to be a part of a session organized by Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance to discuss uh, the report 
with other folks who have done this similar types of research. And that I thought was particularly a good session because we had four of us speaking, we had an hour and a half. So we're really able to give a more detailed description of our work and then also answer questions. I think there are over hundred people um, in the session. Um, a lot of people who are working on these issues day in, day out, who are able to ask us um, good questions, tough questions about the report. And I have heard from folks, friends who work at Baltimore City that, you know, reports getting a lot of conversation. I'd be the last person to say we have all the answers. We definitely don't. But the idea is also, I think, to raise expectations that some, sometimes we're thinking within the, the boundaries of the current programs and current models. And how do we start thinking bigger solutions? And we've got a new city government that will be taking their places by the end of this year, a new mayor, new city council president, a lot of new people on city council. I think a ton of new energy and ideas there. So hopefully this is a time when people can pick up some of these ideas, wrestle with them, maybe come up with their own solutions, but start thinking bigger and start thinking how do we tackle some of these systemic issues rather than piece by piece, program by program? How do we dig deeper? Yeah, and I think bringing awareness to any situation is you're shining the spotlight on it and it's allowing these fresh ideas to come to surface. And they're ideas that people may not have thought about before, thinking outside the box. And so circling back to the Community Leadership Graduate Program at UMBC, is this something that you foresee that, you'll take to the classroom and have lively discussions around this to see what kinds of ideas the students might come up with? Oh, definitely, right. So we have, in a couple of classes, I think we would be thinking about and talking about these issues. Uh, the Introduction to Community Leadership class, which all of our students take um, at the beginning of their community leadership program. We spend a lot of time talking about, thinking about um, cities and the context for the work. And we dig into the Baltimore specific history and, you know, some of the challenging history, right, of, of racial and economic injustice. And we actually spend time out in the community, even now with the COVID-19 crisis, we're planning to do some socially distanced classes with our masks on outside in some Baltimore parks that are adjacent to the neighborhoods that we're going to be thinking about and talking about. So we really want to give folks, in addition to the, you know, the core themes of the class, we want to give them a sense of, you know, Baltimore is a specific place where a lot of these themes have played out and continue to play out and where they can be involved in helping address the challenges of Baltimore through um, their current work um, or through, you know, maybe work that they're looking for with nonprofit organizations, public agencies, private businesses, whatever angle um, they are most interested in. And one thing I think is a great strength of our program is we, we have our core concerns and our, our core issues, but we realize that there are a lot of different ways of coming at these issues. So we're excited to have people coming into the program from the private sector, from the public sector, from the nonprofit sector, and to learn from their experiences and then to help them connect with the groups in Baltimore who are doing the kind of work that they want to do more of. You know, we're, we're young, but we've already got a lot of contacts in Baltimore um, and in the surrounding area, because I think Baltimore County and other counties in Maryland are also facing um, economic inequality, racial justice. You know, these are issues that almost every community um, in our area are facing. So the better equipped, you know, our students are to address them, you know, the better we can help our communities thrive over time. Students will have this applied experience where they'll be on the ground being part of the solution. That's really exciting for them. It really is. And, you know, we found last semester that people were able to connect with groups who were, were very uh, focused on the issues that they were interested in. A couple of examples would be we have a student who's very interested in racial justice. So uh, she found an organization with 
trainers who are both black and white, who've been working together for many years now and educating people in Baltimore, both at the organizational level and the individual level, you know, and having the really challenging conversations of, you know, what is systemic uh, racism? How are we all implicated in it? And how do we um, start to push back against that? So that's called the Baltimore Racial Justice Initiative. And then we had a student who's a military veteran. He was able to connect with a group called the Sixth Branch, um, which is um, staffed by military veterans. So they welcome everybody, military, non-military, um, as volunteers. And they partner with communities in East Baltimore and increasingly around the city to do projects like creating beautiful parks out of vacant lots. And our student found that his military background was actually excellent preparation for his work with this group because they had all, you know, all the staff people in this organization had come out of that same background. There's so many great organizations in Baltimore. They're bubbling up all the time. You know, I'm, I'm learning about groups that I'd never heard about before. So it's exciting to me that there is so much energy and that, you know, Baltimore is known for a lot of things, but I really think it should be known for the energy and commitment of its nonprofit sector. That's a beautiful statement, and I agree. What is the biggest takeaway that you want people to take away from this report? I think the biggest takeaway is that we cannot settle for business as usual, that our existing programs are doing some important work in helping people become homeowners. But if we just tinker with those programs, make modest changes to them, we will not get where we need to go. We really need to put racial equity at the forefront, understand the barriers that black families are facing when they want to become homeowners and directly address those, design programs and policies. And the programs and policies that benefit the most vulnerable among us benefit all of us. I think a lot of white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American families will also benefit if we fix these systems to be more equitable, to be more just, to you know, better serve families of modest means, everyone's going to benefit, the city's going to benefit. But the group that's taken you know, the biggest hit that's faced the most barriers over time is definitely the black community. So I think that's where we have to you know, focus our, our energy. You know, if we get our systems you know, and I mean, this, is, this is from local up to national. As I said before, I think the national policies are, are incredibly important to making this work. But if we can fix and improve and better fund those systems um, that have been traditionally um, working against, I think, our most vulnerable citizens and families, then I think we all will benefit. For those who may be listening to this and they want to be involved in some capacity, how best can they do that? Is there a resource, is there a place you would point them to, to learn more about this report and the things that they can do? Uh, sure. To read the report, all you have to do is go on the ABLE Foundation website into their publication section, and um, the report will be available there. They keep them up, um, I think, pretty much indefinitely. You just have to know when the report was published, which was uh, obviously July of, of 2020. But then if you want to take the next step and really get more involved in you know, solutions for this issue. I think it's, um, and this is what we teach in our community leadership program, it involves first looking in. What is your strength, right? Are you somebody who likes to go to a protest <laughs> and, you know, and wave a sign and chant? Are you somebody who likes to provide more um, behind the scenes support? So really understanding what motivates you and what you do best and what you have time to do and then start exploring the nonprofits that do that work. I mean, they're amazing organizations um, that help build housing for people, like Habitat for Humanity of the Chesapeake. Um, they're organizations that get out there and, and, and do the protesting. Right now, you know, they're protesting so that um, we have adequate funding to help people during the COVID crisis, adequate housing for people during the COVID crisis. Then we have um, organizations that are you know, doing more of the, the long-term policy work. I would really spend some time doing a little bit of research, a little bit of uh, reflection, 
I'm, I'm certainly always happy to, to help somebody find the right organization if that can be helpful. There's a lot of great information online as well. That's great. And I will be linking to that report in the podcast show notes. So people will be able to access the report easily. And there'll be a link to our community leadership webpage with your contact information there. They could reach out to you if they have specific questions. So thank you for offering that as well. Any last thoughts, anything that I did not ask that you think is important that you want people to know? I think we've been somewhat used to thinking in kind of modest terms about what's possible. You know, as somebody who's been working in community development most of my life, uh, I feel like I've been hearing for years that, you know, budgets are going down or funding is constricted. The irony is in this time of crisis, I think it's actually a time to think about things very very differently, start thinking not in terms of scarcity, um, but in terms of possibility. We're a very wealthy country. We're going through a very difficult time right now, but there are all kinds of opportunities that we currently have before us and which will grow, I think, as we overcome this COVID crisis. So if we're really serious about addressing some of the most important challenges, you know, facing our community, facing our country, let's take advantage, you know, somebody said, never let a crisis go to waste. (laughs) I think let's take advantage of this crisis to really rethink our priorities and think more, you know, certainly in terms of race, you know, I think there's been a huge jump forward with uh, all the support for Black Lives Matter, but that needs to continue. And that should be connected to some real, some real concrete changes in policies and, and resources. And you know, we talk about all this stuff in our community leadership program, both in, in the broad, broad terms and in very specific terms. How does this play out um, at the community level? You know, we're, we're eager to you know, encourage anybody who who's really wants to get involved to check out our program and you know, see if you're interested. Well said. Thank you so much, Sally. This has been such an insightful conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed it and it's been eye-opening and it's really an important conversation to have. And I hope that people take away from this the importance of community and how little actions can become big actions. And if we all work together, this world can be truly a better place. Very, very much so. Yeah, we, we, we see it happen. We just need more of it. Thank you, Denise. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank you, everybody who has tuned in today for this episode of UMBC's Miked Up. If you'd like to learn more about UMBC's graduate program in community leadership, please visit us online at leader.umbc.edu. Thank you so much.